Welcome, everybody, to the NFL Show on the Grilly Truth Sports Network. I'm your host for the NFL Show, Mike Goodpaster. Right now, I'd like to welcome in my co-host. First up, from the FF Faceoff, Anthony Servino. How you doing, Anthony? I'm doing awesome, guys. How are you? All right. And, of course, as always, we have our NFL beat writer, Sam Keats. What's up, Sam? Not much, Mike. What's going on with you? Oh, not much. I guess we're just going to talk a little NFL because the Combine, where guys run around in shorts and show us nothing... It would tell us whether they can play football or not. It happens all week, and everybody freaks out about it. It's even on prime time now. Anthony, you going to watch it? Is it on prime time? Oh, yeah. Uh, like, like what, NFL Network? Yeah, or like, it's like prime 4 time to thing. 9 or 4 to 11, something like that. Thursday, Friday, I mean, Saturday. I, I tune in a little bit. Uh, I, I'm more or less watch the highlights and um, and, and, and you know, stuff like that. It's too much. All right. Let's start off with the Johnson. You know, I'm more interested in the combine rumors and anything we hear about, you know, potential trades and free agency and the CBA. That's 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 why I really uh, pay attention to the combine. Uh, those are all old lies anyways, usually used to, as a smoke screen for everybody. Yeah, but they're, uh, they're really good talking points for our show. So. Oh. Okay, I forgot about the show aspect. All right, let's start off with the New York Giants, Sam. Alec Ogletree. The Giants have parted ways with the linebacker, cleared $10 million from the salary cap. What do you think about this? And this is a move because the Giants signed Ogletree a couple of years ago, and he never really transformed into anything. They signed him back in 2018 with the hopes they could become a major part of the defense. And he played all right. He played all right in 2018, but didn't really do much this past season. And now they're trying to get a little younger on the defensive side of the ball, so cutting him and saving some money is probably the best move. All right, now, Anthony, with Ogletree's departure, I think the Giants all have decisions on free agent defensive ends, Leonard Williams and Marcus Golden, along with linebacker David Mayo also. Yeah, the, the uh, Ogletree move, that was expected. That was something that I read during or at the tail end of the season from Giants beat writers. I think they're going to completely gut this defense. Um, they're building their offense through the draft, which is why I think they're going to really target a wide receiver and offensive lineman early. But I think we're going to see them more active free agency wise on the defensive side of the ball. All right. The Jacksonville Jaguars and Doug Marone, who we'll talk about in a little bit, basically are not tipping off who their, who their starting quarterback will be, Gardner Minshew or Nick Foles. Only that the current stable gives them two very good options at that important position. What do you think about that, Anthony? You you broke up there for a second. My dog's uh, crying out. Well, so, shut uh, your damn dog up so we can do the show. But no, I would just say you got Nick Foles and Gardner Minshew to choose from with the Jaguars. Do you think it'll oh. come down between those two, or? I think uh, it's going to be one of those two, and it would not surprise me if it's Gardner Minshew. Um, Nick Foles, this is the second, and, I, and this was my worry with Nick Foles. It seems like any time he leaves Philadelphia, uh, it just doesn't go well for him. He signed a big contract and was vastly outplayed by Gardner Minshew. If they can move on from Foles, and it's going to be hard because of that contract he signed, you're going to have Gardner Minshew for the next three years plus the club option, uh, I believe, uh, on, on a rookie deal for you to build this team around him. Well, the bad thing for Nick Foles is when he leaves other teams, he becomes coached by guys like Jeff Fisher and Doug Marone. Sam? Yeah, you can't blame Nick Foles for everything that goes on in Jacksonville, especially because their receiving core wasn't great. They don't really have a tight end right now to throw to. So there are other issues in Jacksonville. The offensive line dealt with injuries last year. But at the same point, you have to look at the quarterback situation and say, I don't see either of these guys as a, as a viable long-term option at quarterback. All right. The Philadelphia Eagles. Um, Howie Roseman, the general manager, has said that they're going to take a different approach to free agency this time around, Anthony, instead of the you know going out and signing big-time guys. 
it looks like they may go the opposite way. Yeah, um, Philly's going to clean house at their wide receiver core. I think there's a chance we do see Deshaun Jackson uh, retain, but Nelson Aguilar is a free agent. They're not going to bring him back. Alshon Jeffrey, he's as good as gone. Um, Philly's going to attack the wide receiver position probably in the draft, but I also do see them uh, targeting more or less low-end free agents because there's not a lot of high-end guys outside of, like, A.J. Green. I guess Robbie Anderson is considered high-end in this year's class, but uh, if anything, maybe they make a trade, but it's really going to be in the draft and low-end free agents with guys like Demarcus Robinson from Kansas City uh, is one of the names that I've, had, I've heard linked to Philly so far. Well, and I think with the wide receivers in this draft class that they may be able to upgrade it that way even, Sam. Yeah, you've talked about how deep this wide receiver draft class is. You've got guys who go in the fourth round who come in to make a significant contribution right away almost. So if you're Philadelphia, I'm not so much worried about the wide receiver spot in free agency as I am the cornerback spot. Because you're losing uh, Ronald Darby. He's not healthy most of the time anyways. And Jalen Mills, who also has dealt with injuries. But you were so beat up in the defensive backfield last year that basically down the stretch you were playing third and fourth stringers most of the time, with the exception of Malcolm Jenkins. So I really expect Philadelphia to be active uh, looking for low-end defensive backs in free agency. All right, the Miami Dolphins, Chris Greer, Greer, their GM, has told reporters Tuesday at the NFL Scouting Combine that he wouldn't rule out any move, including moving up to number one. I think we're wide open to everything. And currently... Miami has the number 5, 18, and 26 picks. Do you see them trading up all the way to number 1, or do you think maybe they could trade to 2 or 3 to get to a Sam? Yeah, a situation with trading up to number 1 only works if Cincinnati agrees to do it, and I think Cincinnati would be relatively foolish if they let Joe Burrow go. I know you said you believe in both Joe Burrow and Tua, but at the same point, I feel like Joe Burrow, if you're Cincinnati, you've kind of locked in on him. And if you view that there's any difference between Joe Burrow and Tua Tagovailoa and you're in favor of Joe Burrow, you have to keep that number one spot. At the same time, I could see uh, Miami moving up to two to jump Detroit if they feel like Detroit might take Tua. Yeah, and I would think the problem with trading up to number one, I, I think it's hard to turn down 5, 18, and 26 in the draft, Anthony. And you may even be able to get a number two with that. But my concern is <laughs> if I'm the Bengals and it's five, Tua may be gone too then, and then you're kind of stuck. Um, so you're saying in the scenario where Cincinnati trades back out of that one spot? Well, I'm just saying, do you think it's possible? Because if they do, they get 5, 18, and 26. But I think if they do, there's a decent shot that, you know, Burrow and Tua are both gone by the time you get to five. Yeah, but there's a couple of other quarterbacks. You know, there's no, Jordan there Love. Uh, there, there's no. Herbert. No, there isn't. There isn't. There's all. They have Andy Dalton still, and this is a team that has a lot of needs. Yeah, so? And I also feel the same way about the Miami Dolphins um, and their three picks. If I'm Miami, why, I just don't know if I would, if I would, you know, trade all those first-round picks uh, to get a quarterback. Um, Go fill those other needs. Yeah, but if you fill those other needs next year, you need a quarterback, and you're probably picking at number 10. And then maybe next year, uh, with those needs filled, and as long as you don't miss on them, then you trade your first from 2022 away, package a deal to move up. Cincinnati is more in a position to where to take that shot at, a, at that top-end quarterback because they have a talented offense. They have a talented team. I don't know if they have a talented team or not because when you have no offensive linemen, it's hard to be a talented team and no linebackers. So I mean, they have skill position players, which means they have talent. Nothing. They're not depleted of talent like um, you could like Miami. They don't even have a running back on their roster. Well, and the Bengals have a running back. They have Tyler Boyd. What else do they have? I think they. I, I like John Ross. You do. I know you don't. I like John Ross as a deep threat. If he would catch the ball, if that you would retain be great. AJ if they, Green, second, they have did, some receivers. John Giovanni Ross. Bernard's a very capable number two. John running Ross back. is a huge bust, and he's a huge bust because everybody knew he would be a huge bust. His first three years at the University of Washington, he never played more than four or five games. 
The only year he played complete was his senior year. He's come to Cincinnati and he's been hurt the whole time. So it doesn't matter if he can play football or not. He's not healthy. And he's not ever going to be healthy for an entire 16 games, probably. I, I mean, you don't have a big-time tight end. You've got Tyler Boyd. you got Joe Mixon and Gio Bernard. I don't see where that's a ton of weapons. Unless you're banking on Auden Tate being an answer. Because I'm not going to bring up A.J. Green, because A.J. Green right now is not a Cincinnati Bengal. No, you have a point there, but they have the franchise tag to make him a Bengal. But he won't play. And you bring up the offensive line, they're going to get their first-round pick from last year back. I know. And That's going to be an instant upgrade. We don't know they're that because we have not, we've not seen. How do we know it's an instant upgrade? We've do you, never seen so play so what, are, what are your thoughts on Jonah Williams? Do you not? I mean, you liked the pick when they made it. Yeah, I still love the pick. Dollar. But I also think this. We haven't seen him play yet. And the Cincinnati Bengals have a history of screwing up on number one picks in the offensive line. You know, it's like. Three years ago, we had said when Cedric he was hurt and didn't play till the end of the season, well, he's an instant upgrade. It turned out he wasn't because he was instantly a shitty player. He was a bust. So we don't know what Jonah Williams is. And, I mean, this is a Bengals front office that does not have enough scouts, number one, to go watch players. And they don't have quality coaches to coach the players. I mean, my only hope with Joe Burrow is he's so good that it won't matter. Outside of outside of the Ravens, knowing what's going on in Pittsburgh with the you know uncertainty with Ben Roethlisberger and his health, yes, he's probably going to be healthy for Week One, but he's breaking down. That's clear. Uh, no more Bell, no more Brown. I, I mean, and then you have the disaster. That's the Browns. I don't think Cincinnati's that far apart than the rest of those teams outside of Baltimore. Well, yeah, and, but the thing is this, if you add Joe and, Burrow... And Joe Burrow, if he works out, he's a difference maker. Yeah. But when you say they need a lot of players, or they don't need a lot of players, they need a lot of players. But the difference is this, if you get Joe Burrow, then the Bengals are rolling with what I think is a better running back than what the Ravens have. Joe Burrow will undoubtedly better be be better than Lamar Jackson, as will Tua Tagovailoa. So, I mean, either way, you've just upgraded the quarterback and the running back to being better than the Ravens. And the Ravens are going to lose guys, I think, in free agency defensively. And I don't think they were that great anyways. They were much better the second half of the season than they were the first half of the season. So, I'm not saying that the Bengals should trade down. I'm just saying they can't because then they're not going to get Burrow or Tua. And I think this, Burrow and Tua will each win a Super Bowl before their career is over if they both stay healthy. You know, I, I don't see why everybody's so against Tua. Because you see people rip him all the time now. I mean, you know, he came back, the MRIs, everything came back fine uh, with the hip. I think the issue or the uncertainty with Tua is his injury history, is that he's always coming back from something. But Sam? in the same breath, so did Carson Wentz, and four years down the road, Carson Wentz has now played a, a, a full, healthy season. And he and to me, I, I know he played great and he was on that MVP run, but you can make the case this is the best we've seen Carson Wentz play because he had nothing around him. Well, I, I think this. What's your take on this, Sam? We'll go with you first. I, I, I don't understand why Tua suddenly turned into like almost a villain of the NFL draft or something like that because it was that time where we were considering him to be the consensus number one overall pick, and then Joe Burrow showed up, and it's kind of like if Joe Burrow showed up, now everyone doesn't like Tua anymore. I don't understand why we can't just enjoy I don't understand the injury we're... concerns. He hurt his hip. Yeah, we're concerned about that, but there's not a history of injuries here, Anthony. There's just, I mean, he gets nicked up here and here. Everybody does, but he played a complete 2018 season. 2019, he didn't play the last couple games because he got hurt. But when you look at this dude's stats – 2018, this is a complete season where he threw 4,000 yards, 43 touchdowns, six interceptions. 2019, he completed 70% of his passes for the second straight year, 3,000 yards, 33 touchdowns, three interceptions. 
He was in college football for three seasons. He One of those where he was the backup, but I think that season he was the backup is when he came in and won the national championship game in the second half. And in 2018, he leads him again. He plays a complete season. 2019, he missed the last three or four games. But I think the other thing that people are missing out on here is against LSU, Sam, I don't know if you saw that game or not, but LSU jumped out to a huge lead. And Tua just kind of willed his team back into the game playing on that bad hip. Yeah, I mean, I think people have totally underestimated how good Tua is because he's better than any quarterback that's come out of the 2019 draft or the 2018 draft. So you're looking at a guy who's among the two best quarterback prospects in the last three years. How about this? When was the last time we had a quarterback prospect better than Tua? Uh, maybe like Andrew Luck, maybe? Yeah, that's like 2011, 2012. Yeah, it's a while. It's a while ago. Then, then, then what? And I'm not. I'm not the one of those people who are down on Tua. You asked why are people down. I brought up the injury history. Um, is that what's keeping him? You know, if you're saying he's the best since Andrew Luck, then why isn't he going ahead of Burrow? No, because I think that me and Sam are on the same wavelength here. Sam, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think these are the two best quarterbacks since Andrew Luck. Yeah, in terms of, like, their prospects and what we're looking at them coming out of college, their body of work and all that, I believe these are two the two most complete prospects since Andrew Luck at the quarterback position. So, I mean, I know there have been guys coming like Patrick Mahomes came in and lit the league on fire, but that's, like, a little that's a little Patrick different. Patrick Mahomes at this success. stage of his career was nowhere near as good as either one of these guys. It's not even close. Exactly. That's what I was trying to say. He kind of developed into this and became something else during his career in the NFL. Well, plus they gave him the three fastest guys in the NFL to not overthrow. And Travis Kelsey. Yeah. Well, I was, I'm considering Kelsey there too, because tight end wise, he's pretty damn fast. So he was put in a perfect situation. So I'm really, as a Bengals fan, I'm not really sold that it should be or should be Burrow and not Tua because I think one of these two guys is going to end up being a huge star. Now, maybe both of them will, but if you really put a gun to my head and say I had to bet my life on it, I would have bet on Tua before Burrow. Just because there's what a bigger body thing? of work. It wasn't just a one-year thing? Yeah, I mean, Burrow had one great year. I mean, Tua had two great years. And the other year where he played sparingly, he came in the second half, I think it was, wasn't it? Won the national championship. Yeah, let a comeback <laughs> win when they benched Jalen Hurts. Yeah. He filled in for Hurts. Whenever they benched Hurts, brought him in, won it all. And, I mean, he took the starting job from Jalen Hurts who college quarterback-wise is a great college quarterback. So I, I think there's a lot of question here on which one is better. I think the thing that puts Burrow over the top and the reason I would be more comfortable with Burrow right now is just the fact that Tua does have that hip injury that you have to worry about. But if he had a good hip and played all year, I don't know. That's a close call. I feel like people need to be reminded about how strong the Tua hype train was before the injury. Because before this happened, everyone was, was putting him up there in the, same, in the same sentence as Joe Burrow. It was the same discussion. Now it feels like that's changed for some reason. I don't believe that should be the case. Well, 79 touchdowns, 9 interceptions. Actually, if you go with his partial 2017, you're looking at 90 touchdowns, 11 interceptions, and he completed 67% of his passes. You know, or 7,000 yards. I, I feel like at this juncture, people want to claim their stake um, on who's going to be better, make one the enemy. Um, when really, when you brought up Patrick Mahomes, landing spot, a lot of things matter. We're yeah. not even through the combine yet, and, and people want to claim their stake on which player is going to be uh, the next Hall of Fame. Yeah, and it's possible. And I think it's too premature. Yeah, it's too premature two years from now. 
Because that's, you know that's just NFL draft I mean, Twitter. What if the Bengals make AJ Green happy and Jonah Williams is a stud and you got Joe Mixon and you got Tyler Boyd? Joe Burrow goes to Cincinnati. Joe Burrow could put up stats, win a Super Bowl. Tua could go to Miami. It's going to take three or four years to build. Everybody's going to go see. I told you that Burrow was better. And then maybe five years from now, since the Bengals, of course, won't be able to sign their good players and everybody will get old, I mean, Tua has the better career. I mean, so we could see something where Burrow pops into Cincinnati, takes him to the playoffs in a year or two, Tua struggling in Miami because he doesn't have the A.J. Greens. So there's a lot of things that could happen here. And remember this, Opie Taylor coaches the Bengals, which also worries me. <laughs> so, <sighs> you know, it is what it is. So, I, like I said, I think both of them would be great picks for anybody. But, all right. Do you think we're going to get an NFL strike, Anthony? I think it's possible. I do think it's possible because, you know, we've seen some strong player takes and NFL PA takes against the, the, the CBA agreement that the owners want. Sam? Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the agreement doesn't have to be done before this coming season. It's before the next season that has to be done by. I think so. So so there's there's time. It's not it's not like it has to be done this summer and then we're looking at a lockout. No, we got a little bit more Yeah, but how time. about this, though? They want to expand the playoffs – for this coming season, that's not happening. There's no nothing. Nothing they want to do is happening this season. That's not going to happen because there's been too many players going back and forth. On yeah, that. but so then Anthony's Wolf, team can get know. in the playoffs at seven and nine. <laughs> hey, Mike could get in too, but you know, it's hey, not I'm not gonna... in favor of any of it. Yeah, I don't. I, I don't, don't like the change. Here. I don't like change. Me neither. <laughs> I don't think it's gonna happened this year. I mean, we just saw Russell Wilson came out today and said he wants no part of this. He doesn't like he doesn't like the agreement right now. Apparently, Aaron Rodgers was going off on it last night. He doesn't like it either. So, you've automatically got two of the best quarterbacks in the league, two future Hall of Fame quarterbacks who are saying they don't want any part of this deal. So, you know, JJ Watt tore it up immediately. Yeah, on, on social. I mean, it's basically the owners get a lot richer and the players get a tiny bit richer. But at more risk, more games. Yeah. More meaningful games. I hope there's a strike. I mean, because the NFL players need to buck up and sacrifice an entire year. You know, because in 1981, Major League Baseball with Marvin Miller, they sacrificed about 25, 33% of the season. And the Major League Baseball players ever since have made out like bandits on it. Because the MLBPA, that's why the Houston Astros don't have players getting suspended right now for their little thing. Because the Players Association of Major League Baseball is too powerful. That would never happen in the NFL. Plus, we got the XFL now. We don't need the NFL. That's right. Just put the XFL on. We don't need the NFL anymore. Yeah, because those players would just think, go to the XFL and you could break them. Yeah. But here's, here's the thing. I think the issue is that you could send the players who are on the low end. The, the ultimate issue with holding a strike is the players who are on the lower end, the players who are on the bottom fifth of the roster, who are not making like outlet bands, who are not millionaires, who need that money. I think that's the ultimate issue is the players have to represent those guys as well. And yeah, but what's the like what's the minimum salary in the NFL right now? Three or four hundred thousand dollars? Uh, I think so. Okay, so let's say this, Neither. Anthony. How much money did you make last year? About a quarter of a million a year. Uh, a little, little less. Okay, so my point is, if you took a year off, because really, if I made four hundred thousand dollars, I could probably take a couple years off, and it really wouldn't affect me. Unless I'm a complete flaming idiot. Right. Which a lot of these guys are. So I'm just saying, if they would actually think about their future and the future of players coming and the future of the players from the past, they could probably get something done here. But I agree, they probably won't. But hey, they can smoke weed now, it looks like, in the CBA. <laughs> I, listen, I, I'm all for it. I'm all for that. I, for I smoking weed? or? Yes. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> yeah, but because there's less of a shot that we're going to see players strung out on pain pills. All righty. Um, actually, they could put in there that they're allowed to smoke weed and they would ban all pain pills and doctors from NFL premises. But, all right, let's go with our hot topic of today, which are the head coaches that entered the 2020 season already on the hot seat. And I, I think I could start off with my number one here, Anthony, Dan Quinn. He's got to be yeah, a hot seat. You know, Dan Quinn doesn't uh, – there was a chance I thought Dan Quinn was going to get fired after this season. They won a couple of uh, close games over really good teams. I believe they beat the 49ers and the Saints – which shows that the Falcons players play for Dan Quinn. But eventually, with all of that talent, you need to win. So, yeah, Dan Quinn's definitely up there. Yeah, and I think the end of the season, I don't think the end of the season saved him last year. I think he was getting another year anyway, Sam. Yeah, it's usually that's the case. I mean, what's a couple wins during a 7-9 season really going to do? If you play on firing a guy, you're going to fire a guy anyways. I don't think a couple wins will save you, per se. It just helped him publicly, kind of like the public perception of it. But I do think – I thought he should have been fired after this past year, honestly, because that was his fifth year with the Falcons, and they've gone 7-9 and nine in back-to-back seasons. Yeah. So I thought I thought he probably should have been done. All right. Anthony, give us give us your guy. Um, I think, uh, you know, and I'm going to go to your Cincinnati Bengals. I I think Zach Taylor could potentially be on the hot seat after, you know. Please, please use his proper name. Opie Taylor. Okay. If he has another abysmal season um, with Joe, you know, and that's assuming they get Joe Burrow, if they don't win some game. I don't think they can retain uh, Taylor and try and, and possibly ruin the rest of the Joe Burrow project. Um, I think you would immediately want to get somebody in there who can correctly develop him. All right. Number one, we're talking about the Cincinnati Bengals. Number two, Mike Brown is the owner of the Cincinnati Bengals. Number three, in August of 1991, when his daddy died, um, the next year... You know, he goes in, he fires Sam Weish, and he has Boomer Esiason, but he decides to draft David Klingler, and then he names Opie Shula the head coach of the team, who was like, I think he was nine back then, and they let him stay for five years, they let him completely ruin David Klingler, and they still, they kept him for five years is my whole point here. So it's not like the Bengals are real quick to flip the switch on a guy, Sam. Yeah, I don't think Cincinnati is going to do that. Even if they struggle going, I mean, they kept Marvin Lewis forever. So I don't think, I don't think the Bengals will pull the trigger this year. They, but, but, but Marvin Lewis was successful early in his run. No, he was yeah, successful he late in his run. I mean, if you look, 2003-04, he made the playoffs in five. He made the playoffs in nine. So in his first seven or eight years, they only made the playoffs twice. But in his last seven years, they made the playoffs five times. He did just enough to make it hard to fire him, put it like that. Right, and I think we need to see some more fight out of the Bengals for, for Taylor to keep his job. They oh, can't go 1-15 okay. again. They didn't this year. They went 2-14. What the hell are you oh, talking about? Okay. Jeez. We beat wow. Cleveland and Miami. We dominated Cleveland. Well, we didn't beat Miami. We beat the Jets. You know who didn't beat the Jets? Sam, tell <laughs> Anthony who didn't beat the Jets. The Dallas Cowboys. Anthony, tell, tell Sam who didn't beat the Jets. Pittsburgh Steelers. There you go. So now we've turned it in. I get to hit both of you on that all the time. All right, Sam, who do you got is on the – Basically, standing in line, waiting to get shot if he doesn't win some games at the start of the season. Listen, I'm going to go to a guy who actually had a 10-win season last year. I'm taking Bill O'Brien because I'm getting really sick and tired of Bill O'Brien in Houston. Like, honestly, this is at a point where you've got DeAndre Hopkins, who's one of the best receivers in football. You have Deshaun Watson, who's a really good quarterback. And you have time to have a very good defense, depending on if you're healthy or not. I just don't trust Bill O'Brien at this point. Because even though they went 10-6 this past year and won a game in the playoffs, 
I think Bill O'Brien, he turned over play calling, by the way, because he couldn't call plays. He had poor game management, poor time management. He's the general manager for some reason now. And I just don't think he's going to win. He's not going to get the team to the Super Bowl. I don't think he's going to get them over the hump at all. Anthony, what do you think about Bill O'Brien? Um, I agree with all of those points, but because they are using him as a general manager, I have a feeling he's going to be there for a while. And I don't think, and, and that's one of those right or wrong situations. I don't think he should be. Yeah, but I think also this, he's the guy in charge of upgrading that player personnel. So I think he's in trouble too if he doesn't win because he can't really blame it on the GM then. But yeah, he's at the point where he's at the point where there's no one else to point at. He's got to be the guy at the end of the day who's going to be responsible for whatever happens in Houston. All right, I'm going to go with a guy that I think should have already been fired, Doug Marone. Um, you know, he had a decent showing in Buffalo, and he had the anomaly of getting the AFC title game. But it seems like this team has kind of fallen apart. He's oversaw the dud experiment of Nick Foles. Um, Jalen Ramsey wanted to get the hell out of there. He's got a top 10 pick to work with, and I think there's not much left on the leash for Marone, Anthony. Well, they have a couple of first-round picks because they got what the Rams gave them for Jalen Ramsey, um, and they are going to be blowing up this roster. I keep bringing up A.J. Boye is probably going to be a cap casualty. They're moving on from Darius. They're moving on from Jake Ryan. So I think they're going to blow up this team, which could save Doug Marone for another year. Well, hopefully it doesn't. What do you think, Sam? Yeah, I think you should have been done after this past season. If you're going to read Bill and Blur and up, wouldn't you want to do it with a new coach and not – risk the opportunity of Doug Marone messing up your new rebuild. I think that's probably what they should have gone, the direction they should have taken, but they didn't. He's gotten 11 wins over the last two years. I think a lot of his players quit on him at various points during the past season. So I don't see him as a guy who can lead Jacksonville in the future. All right. Um, Anthony, you got anybody else you want to mention? Um, what about Adam Gase? Well, if you think he should be on the hot seat, put him there and give us why. Um, I'm kind of anxious to see what Adam Gase can do this season. They did win, what, around seven, six, seven games last year with, the, with a depleted seven. roster. Yeah. Um, if they can stay healthy and get, you know, C.J. Mosley on the field, get some receivers in there. Then I want to see what Gase can do, but if they're if they're a disaster, uh, I think he's going to be done. Because Adam Gase, in his career, sure he has a winning record with his starting quarterbacks combined with Tannehill and, and Darnold, but he eventually needs to get over the hump. He needs to get into the playoffs and win a game. Yeah, this is a team last year that went seven and nine and got blown out by the Bengals and the Redskins. So you just switch those two games, and maybe you end up in the playoffs. But I mean. I'd like to see Gay stay around and maybe he gets an extra year just because he beat the Dallas Cowboys and the Pittsburgh Steelers. Sam, what do you think about Adam Gase? Uh, you know, you got to bring that up. But uh, I just think that with Adam Gase, he's a guy where he doesn't establish the team yet. You said they lost two teams to two teams they should have never lost to. And that's the issue. That's the issue with that team. I think there will be no consistency for the New York Jets as long as Adam Gase is in control. I think they'll lose games they shouldn't. They'll win, maybe be competitive in games they shouldn't be competitive in, but I don't think how, I don't see how that works out to a long-term formula for winning and making the playoffs. I'll give you this. I think he's on the hot seat, but I think if they make the right free agent signings and have a decent draft, I think they win this division next year. I think this division is pretty wide open with New England losing so much uh, in yeah. free agency. I think Really, the Jets or the Bills can both rise up here and take that spot. And I think Sam Darnold is better than, you know, Jason Allen or whatever the hell his name is. What is his name? Josh There's Allen. Josh Allen. There you go. Um, how about this one for me, Matt Nagy? Am I crazy? No, that's here? a good one. That's because good one. I, I think there are huge expectations. He's got a number one drafted quarterback in Matt Trubisky, which they traded up from three to two to get, which was dumb as hell. 
They've got an all-pro linebacker in Khalil Mack. They made the playoffs two years ago. I think Bears fans are getting tired of this, and I think Nagy needs to win, Sam, and he needs to win this year. Wait, this was a team that people thought in 2019, at least some people thought in 2019, could compete for a Super Bowl win, and they came out and they were flat. They went 8-8 eight and eight with some wins down the stretch. That kind of boosted their record, but they didn't look like an 8-8 eight eight team. They looked much worse. They looked like a 6-5 or five win team. And I think you have to admit, and they're not going to admit this, but they should admit that Mitchell Trubisky was a bad pick, was a bad decision. They're not going to move on from him, which is only going to further drag this team down and eventually cost Matt Nagy, Matt Nagy and Ryan Pace their jobs. All right. Um, Anthony. Um, I, I think what Chicago is going to do, I think they're going to use the uh, the Tennessee route, what they did this year with Mariota and Tannehill, and bring in a capable veteran quarterback just in case Mitchell Trubisky gets off to another slow start. They need to get that running game going. When you talk about flat, I mean, the, it, it was terrible, and I think that really hindered Trubisky because it was all on him. Uh Middle of the season is when that offense turned around a little bit for Nagy and Trubisky, uh, when Anthony Miller, their second-year receiver, finally looked healthy, and they, they, they were a little bit more explosive. But if they don't win games, I'm going to go with you guys, there's no way you can retain, retain the head coach or the general manager because Pace is the one who picked Trubisky, and Nagy inherited him. All right. I got one more, maybe two. Either one of you guys got anything? Sam, you got anybody else? Yeah, I was thinking about where are we on Matt Patricia right now? I'm right with you if you're going to put him on this list. Yep. Yeah, I was going to put him up there. He's 9-22-1 over the past two years. And remember, they were 9-7 and seven the year before he got there. Yeah, it's gotten worse. But, you know, there's been, there's been talk that some players in that locker room, you know, are not following his vision or his plan for the team. So, if this guy doesn't have the locker room at this point, going to his third year, it's hard to imagine that something's going to change at this point. Yeah, and he had the injury excuse for Matthew Stafford. But still, uh, I think he's got to get it done this year, Anthony. You know, Patricia and Quinn, that, you know, we talked about um, the other two, co- you know, the general manager and coach combination in Chicago. I, I think it's the same narrative with the Detroit Lions. Um They have to do something this year, whether it's with Stafford, whether they go after Tua, they need to at least get a wild card spot. Otherwise, they're both out. You know, Matt Patricia is supposed to be a defensive guru and his defense in his first two seasons has been atrocious. You can't put it on the offense because they score points and move the football. All right, guys, we got anybody else or any other topics we want to discuss? I'm going to throw out one more name I could see getting fired just because of the situation he's in. What about Vic Fangio in the, in Denver? Yeah, because John Elway's got a quick trigger finger sometimes. That's what I, that's what I was going to think. Cause I think John Elway might pull the trigger on this one if it doesn't work out well in the second year, and he just might be too quick to move on from everything. Yeah, that really would surprise me, Anthony. No, that wouldn't, but I, I like the way that his defense played at the end of the year. Um, they got their quarterback, I think, in Drew Locke. So I wouldn't exactly say Fangio is going to be on the hot seat. I think Denver is going to be a competitive team. But staying in the West, what about Anthony Lynn? Uh, they just gave him a new contract. And what, what I think since you don't know who the quarterback is, it's hard to really say what the expectations are going to be here. Yeah, I, I, mean, I mean, you could still fire a head coach. Even oh, dude, it's the NFL. Deal. Anybody could be fired by this time next year. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me whatsoever if, if Anthony Lynn got the boot, no matter who's that quarterback, well, because if, they still have a very, very talented team. If you're going to L.A., what about Sean McVay? What if that team goes 5-11, and 11? which I think they very well could? I don't do you, know. I don't know. If do you think this McVay? Go ahead, Anthony. I was going to say, do you think that Super Bowl appearance, say, you know, bought him a couple of years? Well, and at the I, end I, of this year, two years are up. I think the Super Bowl probably bought him another year after this one, honestly, because I think he 
he'll get so much. He got so much praise early on. I feel like that's still carrying over. But by this time next year, a lot of that will have worn off, and we see it him after the 2021 season they're not having any more success he's definitely gone by then i feel like yeah um i'll tell you that it was kevin stefanski because mm-hmm. cleveland coaches usually only get one year i was just gonna go there for the same reason yeah um another one is joe judge yeah. what do you think new york new york can do that new york can take guys out really quickly so i wouldn't be shocked if in a year or two, Joe Judge is already out before he sets everything up. I, I wouldn't be shocked if they pivoted from Judge to Garrett in a year. Um, I hope they do because I, I like when the Giants lose too. Um, anybody else? Ah, how about this? I see if Bruce Arians was to go like 5-11 and 11 this year and still not have a legit quarterback, I could see him retiring. You mean pulling a Vance me actually again? Oh, my health isn't that great. He steps away from football again, and maybe, maybe even like maybe retires full time, or maybe comes back two years from now again, or something like that. I could see him doing that if he yeah. just feels like it's not going to work out in Tampa Bay. Yeah, just get the hell out of Dodge. All right, anything else we want to discuss, guys? Uh, not really. All right, Anthony, tell everybody where they can find the FF Faceoff. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at the Real NFL Guru, and you can follow my show at the FF Face Off, and we can be found at all the top social media and podcast platforms. All righty, Sam. Where can we find you? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at Sam underscore T33 at T E E T S. I post plenty of articles and stats there all the time, so feel free to go check those out. All right, guys, you can follow me on the Grueling Truth at Grueling Truth. Today, later today, we'll have a 3 o'clock Xavier basketball show with former Xavier legendary announcer Andy Mac Williams. And then tonight at 9, we will have the XFL weekly show with Brian Schmidt. And also tonight at 11 o'clock live, we'll have Inside Boxing Daily with Jeremiah Pricer. So make sure you check all those shows out. You can hear us on iHeartRadio, Spreaker, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you find podcasts, you'll find the grueling truth. So for now, who, who's on this show again? I'm just kidding. Sam, for Sam Teets, for Anthony Savino, I'm Mike Goodpaster. You've been listening to the grueling truth where the legends speak.